Hi there, astronomy students. Mr. Newland here. I wanted to go through how the Hertzsprung Russell Exploration Lab should work. This is meant to be a, a lifeline if you don't know what's going on. So I'm going to really probably do this in two steps. Uh, first thing I'll do is open it up. And you'll notice that it looks like a web page, but it's not quite a web page. This is an, uh, a live notebook, meaning that it's got code and it's got a, a language in it called Markdown that lets me display text, kind of like HTML. So and if you'll everywhere there's one of these blocks, I sort of zoomed in there, everywhere there's one of these blocks, that's actual programming code and they're meant to be separate so I can run just one block or just one block or just one block. However, whenever I put these labs together, you're meant to run one and then make sure you understand what it did and then run the next one and make sure you know what it did and then the next one. They are meant to be done in order. But if you change one, like if you change this one, you don't have to go rerun all the previous chunks of code. This is based on something called uh, Jupyter Notebook. and Google luckily has made a version of Jupyter Notebook software, the platform running Python that runs in the browser. So we can actually save it to our own computer. And by the way, that's the first thing you need to do is file, save a copy into Drive. So you need a copy saved into your own computer. I'm not your own computer, excuse me, your own Drive. That way any changes that I make will actually stay because this one over here, this is in my drive and you're not allowed to save that one. So without actually, uh, there's also a click copy to drive right there, which makes it a lot easier too. So I don't even need this tab anymore. I've got it ready. I've got my own copy uh, and maybe I'll put my initials there, JN. So I, JN copy up. So I know it's mine. So there are blocks that just have plain text and sometimes they have images and sometimes they have links. And if you wanted, you can actually double click and see the markdown code that displays things like how do links work and how do images work. But you don't have to do that if you don't want to. Then there will be sections that say question one and under it a block that says double click here to answer. So if you double click on that, you go to the end of that and answer whatever the question was. Put your name in period, J Newland, period five and five through seven, because I'm all of those. And anyone I'm working with, working alone, how sad. I recommend you work with other people. And I can either hit shift enter, and it, it closes that block, or if I double click on it and I'm typing, you can also just click somewhere else. And by the way, it's a Google document. So notice how it says all changes saved. It's saving as I go. Another benefit of running on the web and running in your browser, you also don't have to have any software on your own computer to actually write programming code. This is becoming a more common way for computational scientists to do their work is to use the web instead of having to download everything onto their own computer. You All you need to do is have internet access in a web browser and you can you can compute. So that was question number one. I put my name. So what are we doing? So uh, I borrowed the uh, most of the code and the data from someone named Adam Lemie, who wrote uh, a really cool website called codingink12.org that has a lot more really cool collab notebooks, not just astronomy, but in other scientific disciplines like biology, chemistry, and physics, and other things. So be sure and check out codingink12.org, and thank you to Mr. Lemie for making this available, and I'm pretty sure I linked his stuff down at the bottom. So what are, what's going on here? This first five lines, so look, each of the, by the way, you can tell it's color-coded to make it easier to know what you're doing, including this line right here that says import modules that contain functions we need. That's a comment. Mr. Lemie wrote this so that, and here I am letting you see as the, the programmer giving you the code, hey, this is what this chunk of code does. And here's another comment that tells you what that does. Here's another comment. Here's another comment. Whenever you're writing code for another person to read, comments make it easier in human language to say, hey, I think this part of my algorithm does blah. It's not for the computer, it's for a human. So whenever there's that uh, uh, pound sign, whatever's after it, the computer actually ignores it. So that's what that's the benefit of running comments. So I'm using pandas and numpy and matplotlib. These are all really standard uh, libraries that I need to import or modules that we need to import for visualizing data sets. So I'm going to make sure and hit play. So I've got all that imported or none of the rest of the lines of code will work. 
So the expectation is you have to hit play or hit shift enter to run each block. Like I'll click on this guy and hit shift enter and it runs it just like you hit the play button and it'll run that chunk of code. And you have to do them in order, in order for the later on data, like down here in order for this to, to run correctly, this one had to have run in this one and this one and this one. Actually, these two are just for demonstration purposes, but you don't necessarily know what a line of code or a chunk of code is doing. So run it and that way you'll have it. By the way, if you mess it up, you can always go back to the original and start over or you can undo. You're not going to hurt anything by typing things incorrectly or getting an error. You can uh, always get back to where you were. Okay, so uh, I this line of code goes to this big long URL and accesses our uh, data as a comma separated values, which is a, um, something you could do like in Microsoft Excel or Google Spreadsheets. You can actually save it as a, a data file as opposed to just like a, a working document. So uh, that's what that is. And uh, I'm using uh, pandas to turn this into something called a data cube. So that's what line two is. I'm building my data cube. And let's actually look at the first five lines of the data cube. So here they are. Notice, by the way, that the first uh, row is actually labeled zero. That's very common in computer science. And then there's a set of headings across the top. Those are my columns. This is the proper name. This is the right ascension. This is the declination. This is the distance. This is the, I, and I'm assuming this is in light years. No, it's in parsecs, uh, even though it, it probably should say. Here's the apparent magnitude. And I know that one's apparent because the other one here says abs. So this is the absolute magnitude. That's one of the pieces of data I actually need for each row from my data cube. I don't necessarily need the name or the right ascension, all these other things, but I definitely am gonna need the absolute magnitude later on. Then there's something here called CI which I don't even know what that stands for. I probably should, but I don't. And here's another one. That's the temperature of the star. And this is clearly in Kelvin because there's 5,800 for the sun. Then there's this uh, X, Y, Z uh, coordinate, which I actually don't know what that is either, but it must be galactic coordinates and something. I don't even know what that is. And then um, there's the constellation name right there. Con, then the luminosity and solar luminosity units, like is it brighter than or less bright than the sun? So notice the sun is one. And then there's whether or not it's variability and some other in for this var, var min, var max. That's how much it varies in magnitude. Uh, so that's what all those columns are. I, I don't even know what they all are necessarily. And that's not that uncommon when doing a data science project. You are interested maybe in just a little bit of the data. And there's other things that maybe a data archive has and you don't know what they are. So that doesn't really matter. You get to the pieces you need and kind of ignore the rest. So notice after I hit play, and if I make this say seven instead of five, it gives me the first seven rows, again, starting with zero. So that's what the command dot head this function is doing. And it belongs, by the way, to the data cube. So this is a, a sort of an object, object dot function or object dot method for those of you that are used to, to Java. Um, and if you don't know what I mean, that doesn't matter. I'm gonna go back and put five because I liked it better. And, um, and every time you wanna rerun it, you can hit shift enter, hit the plus button. And by the way, the last line that was run will have Whatever the number is in the square brackets there, so that's five, that's the last thing you ran. So when I hit play here, that is now a six. And data.shape is a way of asking how many rows, how many columns. So it's always row major order. So there's 119,614 rows. That's how many stars there are in our data set. And there's 16 individual uh, columns, so that's 16 pieces of information potentially about each star. By the way, again, I'm going to be most interested in the absolute magnitude and the temperature. Those are the kind of the most important things, but you could also do absolute magnitude and solar luminosity if you have that data. I just happen to have both of them. So it looks like I'm up, up to another question here. So let's get acquainted in the table above. What do you think each column represents? Uh, and maybe I'll go through and save them all. RA is right ascension. Let's definitely not do them all. Oh, wait, I misspelled ascension. And deck is 
declination and um, abs mag is absolute I can do this magnitude and temp is temperature in Kelvin those are the only ones that really matter and if you want you can list the others as well uh, I also think oh yeah there were two questions there um how many stars there are 119 614 uh, stars in the data set. Shift enter to save it. Cool. So be sure to run this chunk of code before you try and do number three. It's going to actually generate a plot out of our data. So I, I want to spend a couple of minutes making sure to tell you what this is doing, and then we're going to stop this video. So what are, are these six lines doing? Number one is creating a figure so that we can actually generate a plot a graph and it's very common in scientific uh, publications to refer to a plot or a graph as a figure so that's why that's called that and it's a uh, 15 rows by four columns so that's why you know that doesn't matter too much you don't probably care too much about the size this line though is really important that line's actually creating a scatter plot so it's for every single x data point it's going to find the matching y data point and it's going to put a blue dot there on this plot that you see here so the title by the way since uh, i'm plotting as my x variable the right ascension then i should let's let's actually go through them that way where it says x label right ascension and i know that because that's the first thing in front of the comma in the plt.scatter function. So I'm telling uh, matplotlib, the plt object, hey, make me a scatter plot. Here's all the data that goes on the x-axis. Here's all the data that goes on the y-axis. And by the way, if you give the name of your data cube and then one of the columns, Python will go and get all of the right ascensions in the data cube and bring it back as a list. Then, as long as it has the same number of rows, which it does here, It'll, I'm telling it for the Y to use all of the declinations from the data cube. And you don't need to quote unquote loop over each element in the list. If you give a list to this Python command and matplotlib, it knows to go through the whole list and match up the very first right ascension to the first declination. Find that on this chart, put a blue dot. Then the second right ascension matched with the second declination. Whatever that XY pair is, it puts a blue dot. And it goes through all 119,000, putting a blue dot. For every right ascension, it matches to that declination. So it would go here, here, put a blue dot. It would go here, here, put a blue dot. It would go there, there, put a blue dot. Okay? That's what's going on with that plt.scatter. Then there's a plt.xlim, which is like, uh, how do I want the limits on my x-axis to go? Notice that it started with 24, then zero. So the bigger number is first. So matplotlib is smart enough to know that you want to go from 24 down to zero. Whatever the first number is, it puts at the origin. Whatever the second number is, it assumes it's going to grow to the right. And remember that right ascension is backwards in the sky. The sun start comes up in the east and sets in the west but right ascension counts towards the east that's because every hour you'll see a different object coming up on the eastern horizon so just a reminder that right ascension runs kind of backwards uh in the sky now this is something we've discussed a long time ago but that's why it's 24 comma zero um and then the this y value should be declination so that's meant to be the declination. And then the title, since this is the right ascensions and declinations of all the stars, this is a sky map of our stars. And if I hit play or shift enter, it'll rerun the code, but now it has my title for the row, for the X axis, for the Y axis, and for the plot itself. So that's the, the deal here. The first, this line makes a scatter plot. This line decides how your x-axis is laid out. And if you're fine with it going from 0 to 24 instead of the other way around, you don't even need the xlim command. As a matter of fact, if I comment it out and then run it again, 
it goes from zero to 24 now. So I'm going to get rid of that comment so that it actually goes the way I want. Shift, enter. There we go. And notice this kind of sort of sine wave looking thing. That is from the galaxy that we are in having so many stars in the disk of the Milky Way galaxy that as you look at the Milky Way galaxy disk, now remember we are, or maybe you don't know this, but the, the solar system is actually tilted. We don't orbit the sun in the same plane that the sun goes around the Milky Way. So we are kind of at an angle, which is why all the stars in the Milky Way seem to make the sort of sine wave as we were to look, look at them all throughout the night. I lost my mouse there. Hopefully we'll be okay. So uh, when you're answering these questions about the declination and right ascension, that's what I'm asking you to do. Make sure that the right ascension and declination titles are good and maybe explain the patterns here and why are, you know, you see kind of stars scattered everywhere else. Take a guess at why you think stars are scattered everywhere else on the plot. So that, that's kind of a good start.